When we Christian leaders take one facet of Christ, one angle of vision on Christ, one part of Christ, and magnify that, make that the theme of our ministry, make that our brand, uh, make that our message, and parlay that one aspect of Christ into a ministry, that's not Christian. My point is that truly Christian leadership will not limit itself to branding, exploiting, um, developing a following by pressing, pressing, pressing on one issue or one doctrine or one aspect of the real Christ. Mm. But we will hold ourselves responsible to the, to the more demanding task, the more thrilling task mm. of entering into, exploring, daring to believe in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Welcome back to You're Not Crazy, uh, a podcast hosted by the Gospel Coalition. Uh, I'm with Ray Auckland. Hi, Ray. Hi. How are you, Sam? I'm very well. Ray, we're, this is season two. Yeah. I, I still can't quite believe season one happened. <laughs> I know. Why is anybody listening? <laughs> I don't know, but uh, we are very grateful to, to those of you who, who have been listening, and uh, we've loved hearing from many of you. Yeah. Thank you to those of you who've written to us. Some of you have, have shared something of your own situation, your own hopes, prayer needs and it's it's been a privilege to to hear some of your stories so thank you for sending those things in yeah we're very grateful and it's a privilege to for sam and me to have this moment with you it really matters we believe in your ministry you're not crazy to live for christ you're not crazy to stick your neck out you're not crazy to hang in there you're not crazy to have a dream in your heart of a great movement of god in your generation you're so not crazy you just hang in there and let's walk together for a while Sounds good to me. Ray, since uh, we had our last season, what's one great experience you've had? Well, um, in, let's see, early November, Jenny and I were confirmed as members of the Anglican Communion by Bishop Clark Lowenfield in the Diocese of the Western Gulf Coast down in Houston. And that was a sacred uh, moment. I it, a surprise to us, really, that, you know, our journey has, has led us there. But the Lord was very much in it. And uh, and you and I love Bishop Clark. He's he a is, wonderful man. Oh, gosh. He is a, a, an amazing man of God. I'll go into battle with him any day. So that was, how about you, Sam? What's some <laughs> remarkable uh, experience since we were together last? Uh, well, I was going to say something quite banal compared to, to what you just mentioned. <laughs> Um, I've been paddleboarding for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> You're great, Sam. <laughs> uh, which was great fun. I, I had the opportunity of being in Dubai in October with um, Redeemer Church Dubai. One of the pastors there took me out first thing in the morning before it got hot to, to go paddleboarding. I'd never done that before. But it was beautiful. Um, the water is lovely and warm, which is good because you get into it a few times if you're trying to <laughs> paddleboard, yeah. I discovered. But it was beautiful. We had the, the city skyline as a backdrop, and it was one of those moments of of just of great joy. Hmm. Going back to your confirmation, Ray, what does what does it mean you becoming an Anglican, and what doesn't it mean? What it does mean is that uh, I come under the fatherly ministry and headship of Bishop Clark because I've already aligned. Theologically, with the 39 Articles, which are a fantastic Reformation doctrinal statement, um, the Westminster Confession of Faith borrowed from the 39 Articles when it was being composed. And anyway, I, I come under that ministry, and uh, now Jenny and I have the privilege. It's, it's a whole new area the Anglican Communion is worldwide and is massive. It really is a, a manifestation of every tribe, tongue, uh, and so forth. So we are now part of this massive Christian family around the world with more opportunities to uh, spread the gospel. And uh, we, we feel deeply privileged. Hmm. And what doesn't it mean? What hasn't changed with you oh, becoming Anglican? Well, what hasn't changed is my identity has not changed. Mm. Um, I am not an Anglican. I am an Anglican Christian. Mm. 
the word Anglican is an adjective. The word Christian is a noun. And that's my identity. Yeah. So uh, I have not, what hasn't happened, Sam, is I have not distanced myself from other believers. All Christians, we share the same identity in Christ. Mm. And then the various uh, groups we're a part of are places where we can just sort of uh, enter in and get really comfortable and go deep and become productive long-term. So um, it's if, if we understand our various uh, locations within Christianity in a healthy gospel-centered way, we feel simultaneously linked profoundly and joined and united with all Christians everywhere mm. and happily uh, located and fruitfully located right where the Lord wants us within that totality. That's wonderful. And still at Emmanuel, that hasn't oh, changed. Yes. Oh, oh, we adore Emmanuel Church, <laughs> Nashville, and Pastor TJ and everyone there. Great. Well, we've, we've talked about Bishop Clark. We've just mentioned Pastor TJ, um, and TJ is going to be joining us later this, this season for an episode or two, um, which brings us on to today's topic, which is is leadership. Um, and this this may seem like a an obvious question, but it's it's one I I found myself wrestling with a lot, and that is, what makes Christian leadership Christian mm-hmm. leadership? Presumably, it's not just the fact that the person doing the leading happens to be a Christian. Presumably, there is a Christian way to lead, mm-hmm. and it'd be good for us to to think about that. And indeed, what makes anything Christian leadership, whatever it might be. And uh, I, 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 this is a burning question, Sam. Yeah. We have all in in Britain and in America, we elsewhere, we have all been shocked, and we have been betrayed by leaders, presumably authentic Christians, whose leadership was so unlike Christ, even mm. contrary to Christ, not just falling short, but opposite to Christ that the destruction was profound yeah. and publicly grievous. So the question really matters. How would you answer this question? What makes Christian leadership truly Christian? Well, one one part of that answer, and I'm, I'm saying this against myself as much as I am against anybody else, but, but thinking through the impact your son Dane's book, Gentle and Lowly, has had, it seems to have struck a vast swathe of the Christian world as as news that Jesus is in fact gentle and lowly. And that, that begs the, the, the painful question, yeah. um, is that something we hadn't already learned from the way that we've been led? So gentle and lowly, the fact that the response to that book has been so strong and emphatic and widespread. And surprised. A lot of people go, I did not know Jesus was like this. Yeah. And that that has to be some indictment on all of us are we not is it not obvious from the way we are shepherding churches that jesus himself wow. is gentle and lowly of heart yeah so that's the challenge isn't it how, how can we lead in a way that that reflects the good shepherd himself we're, we're under shepherds he's the good shepherd we, we need to be shepherding in a way that is very much congruous to to his own heart yeah. his own approach so sam what would be what would be some opposites to gentle and lowly? Well, Jesus gives us one of them in, in the famous part of Mark chapter 10, when he says, not even the Son of Man came to be served, but to serve. And he, he says in that section um, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. So that kind of big dealness, I'm the one who's in charge, you all revolve around me. Um, if even the Son of Man, and the, the, the logic is, the son of man of all people is the one with the greatest authority. If the, the person in the universe with the greatest authority is not wielding that in a way that is, you are all here to revolve around me, but actually I am here and using that very authority to lay down my life for you. Um, that is, in one level, that, that servant-hearted, it, it's it's more than servant-hearted, it's it's cruciform, isn't it? Wow. So it's, it's using whatever institutional authority, natural power, by virtue of our gifting, our personality, whatever we've got going for us, whatever natural authority we possess has to be wielded for the sake of of the other, not for the sake of ourselves. Mm-hmm. 
that's got to be one component, surely. When I think of gentle and lowly, our Lord's own words describing himself right down to his core being, his heart. This is who he is and cannot not be, Mm. who he always will be. It's not a strategy. This is not a leadership strategy from Jesus. This is who he is. And the opposite would be, with a lot of ways to say it, bullying and haughty. Mm. Um, Whenever Christian leaders use coercion, force, shaming, um, that's not a falling short of the glory of God. That is opposite to mm. the glory of God. It is a betrayal. And um, it's and fleshly, isn't it? It's meaning taking a shortcut. Yeah, an unprincipled shortcut. Instead of doing the right thing, that is Christ-like, and trusting Him for the outcome. Yeah. There are obviously paradigms of leadership we see in the world around us, business world, army, all kinds of other areas of of leadership. And much we can learn from various secular forms of of leadership. Each of us will have our own heroes of of people over the years that we've we can think, yeah, that that's a wonderful example of leadership. But there is a certain that this Christian cruciformity is not something we're not likely to learn that piece from even wonderful examples of leadership around us. And cruciform meaning? Well, this idea that I actually, I, I'm going to cause myself pain rather than causing the other person pain in order to, to move things forward here. Yeah. Cross shaped. Yeah. Yeah. So what we're saying, Sam, is that Christian leadership is not leadership that advances Christian orthodoxy. Christian leadership is leadership that is itself operating with, moving forward in, flavored by Christ himself. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I think of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13, this remarkable language. It refers to mature manhood as the measure of the stature of, of the fullness of Christ, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. When we Christian leaders take one facet of Christ, one angle of vision on Christ, one part of Christ, and magnify that, make that the theme of our ministry, make that our brand, uh, make that our message, and parlay that one aspect of Christ into a ministry— that's not Christian. But it, it, it can feel, it's surprising because if we're half right, we really are half right. Hmm. But given our nature, our fallenness and our flawed nature, we don't feel simultaneously or even see we are half wrong as well. So we have a really legitimate insight into Christ that we all can and should rejoice in, but there is so much more to him. So my point is that truly Christian leadership will not limit itself to branding, exploiting, um, developing a following by pressing, pressing, pressing on one issue or one doctrine or one aspect of the real Christ. Mm. But we will hold ourselves responsible to the to the more demanding task, the more thrilling task mm. of entering into, exploring, daring to believe in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we ourselves are always learning. We're always on a growth edge and we're sharing, we're leading people into the adventure of discovery. Mm -hmm. And we are not saying, uh, see me here, uh, you really need me because I have understanding, I have knowledge, I have information, I have doctrine that you don't have, you need me. That is not Christian. Mm-hmm. But going, could, saying to people, could we go together into the vastness of Christ, all that he is, which will inevitably stretch us and enlarge us 
and our own theological tradition will be stretched and enlarged. We'll have to make some adjustments, but as long as we're following Christ according to Scripture, we are on a roll. This is going to be great. Now, that, it seems to me, that the kind of reverence hmm. for the, the stature of, of Christ in his fullness, that I look at that kind of leadership, and I see humility, yeah. I see openness, and I see a better future for me and everybody who gets involved. I think that's Christian. Well, you think of John the Baptist, he must increase, I must decrease. And I think sometimes we, we get this weird metric in our minds of, I've, I've got to be looking good so Jesus can look good. And so my leadership has to look good because I'm the PR agent for, for Jesus' leadership, <laughs> which is, is <laughs> tempting and fleshly and, and in some senses attractive, other than the fact that it's, it's completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder, you know, in my own heart, how many times I've thought, well, he must increase and I'll increase too. And we'll do this together. Yeah. Um, I'll share my platform with Jesus. I mean, I owe him <laughs> a lot, right? I'll be big about this. So, uh, you know, I, people should notice Jesus and uh, it doesn't work that way. Your, your comments about how, you know, you all need me and I'm the indispensable one. Um, I, I love the parable of the growing seed in Mark 4 where the farmer sows the seed and then he sleeps and the seed grows. There's, there's that sense of dispensability about each one of us. If, if we really believe that Christ is the one who builds his church, it's his word that does the work, I, that the kingdom is not dependent on me. Um, I can actually... I can sleep at night, and, and God's not worried that I'm inactive. Hmm. Okay, I'll be so bold to say this, Sam. The arch enemy of authentic ministry that we pastors should actually be afraid of is not only heterodoxy, heresy, theological betrayal. The arch enemy is also pastoral big dealness mm -hmm. and swagger um even within an orthodox framework any pastor who is throwing his weight around making demands and it's way too important to him to be noticed and to be cultivating celebrity status that is a stab in the back of Jesus Christ. Wow. God spare us. Yeah. Which must mean that one essential feature of Christian leadership is, is if nothing else, we're also leading in repentance. Yeah, that's good. Um, I, I was thinking on, on what Paul says in, in 1 Timothy 4. Um, he says to Timothy in, in verse 14, do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by, the, by prophecy when the council of elders la laid their hands on you. Practice these things, immerse yourself in them so that all may see your progress. Mm. So it, it should be possible for a church to see its pastor growing in faith. And that will involve at times the pastor saying, hey, you know what, I've, I've realized like this, this particular topic, I got this wrong in the past. Mm. I've now realized the Bible actually says this about it, or I'm realizing I need to repent of this particular sin in my heart. It's the fact that the church is meant to see our progress is, is meant, presumably it means that the church is seeing us learning and that involves repenting as well. Yes, learning and growing. I remember my dad said to Lake Avenue Church one time, he said, I believe this church needs a new pastor. And I'd love to be that new pastor. <laughs> <laughs> How can you not admire and follow a man with that kind of heart? That's wonderful. Yeah. Ray, just one other quick thing, um, right. which you, you and I were chatting about just before we started recording. Um, in Philippians, Paul talks about how he feels yeah. about the church. Just yeah, I, I noticed this just last week, Sam. I was, I was uh, preaching out near Philadelphia on Philippians chapter 1, and Paul says, as I recall in verse eight, it is right. It is right. Here's a right, wrong issue. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. And this is in chapter one of the book. It's not an afterthought. It is what the apostle front loads in serving uh, and, and, and ministering to mm. this young church. 
He's not embarrassed about how he feels about them. He says, it is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart. Hmm. Um, there is an emotional, relational quality to truly Christian leadership that is beautiful. Yeah. Let's, let's dare. Can we give ourselves permission to let Christ make even us beautiful? <laughs> and it was right not just for Paul to feel that way, but for to tell them that he felt yes, that way. That's right. He wanted them to know how he felt. That's right. Yeah, and he wasn't embarrassed. He wasn't apologizing. Yeah. He would have had to apologize if he hadn't told them. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we are thankful to Crossway Books for sponsoring the You're Not Crazy podcast with the Gospel Coalition. We love Crossway. Sam, you just told me about a book that Crossway is uh, soon going to republish. And um, remind us what that is. Oh, I'm so glad. Uh, there was a book that came out, I think, in the early 90s by Don Carson and John Woodbridge called Letters Along the Way. And it was their sort of doing a reverse screw tape letters. It was letters from a fictional seminary professor to a young convert. And then uh, the letters then kind of spanned over, you know, several years of this, this man becoming a Christian, growing in his faith, going into pastoral ministry. And it, it's a book that affected me profoundly when I read it. I was a, a very young Christian, but beginning to sense the Lord leading me into pastoral ministry. And my my pastor put this book in my hand. Oh, wow. And that book has become a dear friend. Yeah. Um, it is full of wisdom and character and insight. And Crossway, wonderfully, are republishing it um, in uh, just a, a couple of months' time, I think. Right. So Don Carson, John w Woodbridge, Letters Along the Way. I I feel the same way you do about the book. I mean, it, it marked me. I, I still, it, I can see it in my mind's eye on the page. A quote they included from John Wesley. John Wesley wrote a letter to a young pastor in the uh, Methodist movement and kind of leveled with him and said, now, the reason why your people find your ministry tedious <laughs> is you don't read at all. You're not growing. You're not reading and going deep uh, in your own understanding of the gospel. And you need to read books. And if that was true in the uh, 18th century, how much more is it true now? We need to put our smartphones down and put them in another room and read I want to say to the younger pastors of the rising generation, you must, M-U-S-T, must guard your capacity to read and study and think. Mm. Don't let any device rob you of the dignity of careful thought and discovery. That That is a gift of God, and it enhances your stature and make, takes you to a deeper place with Christ Himself, and and makes you repositions you for tremendous fruitfulness mm. in your ministry. You must read. Okay. Yeah. The, the the smarter our phones get, the dumber we get. Boy, that's right. <laughs> well said, Sam. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ray. 